stars in this energy range or the still hot wreckage of exploded stars. Observing in the high energy part of the spectrum is a bit like reading the tabloid headlines of space. We see the blow-ups, the train wrecks, the messy divorces of the stars. But we only see hints of all these things by looking in the ultraviolet. To see the really weird and lurid stuff, we have to go to still higher energies, X-rays and gamma rays. The astronomers who study ultraviolet light and their colleagues who observe X-rays and gamma rays are, in a sense, extending the spectrum. It was back in the 18th century that we first learned that this wider spectrum even exists and that there's more to light than meets the eye. William Herschel was the most famous astronomer of the time. From his home in southern England, Herschel had discovered the planet Uranus. That discovery made him an international celebrity, but he didn't let the fame go to his head. Instead, he simply built himself the largest telescope in the world and spent most of his remaining years conducting a patient survey of the entire sky. One day, he was experimenting with a discovery made famous by Sir Isaac Newton. Newton showed that you could use a prism to split a beam of sunlight into its spectrum of colors. Herschel had the clever idea of putting a thermometer into each color to see if all the different colors carried the same amount of heat. According to his experiment, they did. While taking notes at one point, he parked his thermometer just off the red end of the spectrum. To his astonishment, he found that it warmed up. Heat energy was being carried by some completely invisible component of sunlight. These mysterious heat rays were somehow even redder than red. Today, we call this radiation infrared. Herschel's accidental discovery led us to realize that there are forms of invisible energy on either side of the familiar rainbow of colors. Today, we call this whole range of colors, visible and invisible, electromagnetic radiation. One of the great achievements of 20th century astronomy was to open up the full width of this range. As we've explored it, we have found that nature has secrets to tell us at every point on the spectrum. It's sort of like the story, the old story of um, the blind man and the elephant, right? Um, the way it used to be in astronomy is that people were firmly in one camp or the other. You had radio astronomers, you had optical astronomers, uh, you had infrared astronomers, and they didn't talk to each other that much. And they really had a, different pictures constructed of the objects that they were looking at, just as the five blind men holding different parts of the elephant would tell you very different things about what an elephant is like. But now it's becoming more and more common that astronomers have a multi-wavelength perspective. The lowest energy radiation is called radio. Radio, in a sense, is even redder than infrared. In scientific terms, it's longer in wavelength. Astronomers have studied radio signals from space since the end of World War II, when big antennas and sensitive receivers from wartime radar became available. In the years since, radio astronomy has revealed cosmic insights that could have been found in no other way, like these huge lobes of dilute gas squirting out from the center of a distant galaxy. There's no trace of these immense structures in visible light. Ultraviolet radiation is a far more concentrated form of energy than radio. Ultraviolet lies off the violet end of the visible rainbow. Technically speaking, that makes it high energy or short wavelength radiation. Yet the ultraviolet astronomers are working in the least extreme part of the high energy spectrum. X-rays are even more energetic. And the most potent form of energy of all is known as gamma radiation. Most of the energetic processes that happen in the universe um, create 
uh, regions of high temperature, regions of high density, um, and these sorts of, of regions will create emissions that have very high energy, like X-rays or gamma rays. The X-rays, because they're so energetic, can probe down into the center of galaxies. So you can look all the way into the core of the galaxy, which is really neat, and see these processes happening near the black hole, which is one of the things that I study. Um, also, in the inner regions of jets, these large-scale jets that you see in galaxies. Um, in the radio band, we study the outer parts of those jets, but you can actually look at the inner regions in the X-rays. So I guess the thing that the X-ray um, wave band has shown us is that the universe is not this kind of beautiful, quiet, nice, pleasant looking uh, place we think it is by looking at optical images. It's really quite a violent place and there's a lot going on that we hadn't known until we started looking at it at high energies. Astronomers are eager to observe the universe at these high energy ranges, but it's not easy. They have to launch their telescopes into space aboard rockets or satellites because almost none of that radiation can penetrate down to Earth's surface. So high energy astronomy is a child of the space age. You can't really observe X-rays from the ground because um, they're blocked by the atmosphere. They get absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, which turns out to be good for us because if they didn't, um, we would be exposed to this huge flux of cosmic X-ray radiation. Um, so we really had to wait until we had rocket technology to be able to launch above the atmosphere to see the X-rays. And the rockets really weren't perfected until around the early 60s or so. Um, so that's really when X-ray astronomy began. But it's not simply a matter of lofting a telescope into orbit and checking out the X-rays, there's a big problem working with such penetrating radiation. How do you build a telescope that can collect and focus X-rays? Problem is that uh, an X-ray tends to go through a telescope just the way it goes through a human body, and that makes it a little difficult to build it. But as luck has it, uh, physics has been kind to us, and there is a technique which allows us to reflect X-rays. What we have to do is get a very nice shiny mirror, just the regular equivalent of a, a telescope surface, but we have to bring the X-rays in at a very low angle so they skip off the surface like a stone off the surface of a pond. This is called grazing incidence. And using that technique, we can focus X-rays, but the telescopes look uh, rather different. With grazing incidence mirrors in their telescopes, scientists have opened up a high energy window on the universe. X-rays are showing us that space is a surprisingly violent place, full of searing temperatures and cosmic catastrophes we'd never even suspected. In fact, the X-ray universe seems barely recognizable as the place we live in. It was once predicted that nothing in the universe could be hot enough to emit X-rays. But as soon as technology made it possible for astronomers to take a look, it became clear that in fact, the universe puts on quite a show for X-ray observers. The sun is mostly too cold to emit X-rays, but little understood magnetic effects on its surface cause localized hotspots, flares and storms that give the X-ray sun a strangely irregular appearance. Solar flares can affect communication and power transmission here on Earth, so they're monitored closely. You can check out the solar weather in your choice of visible light, ultraviolet, or X-rays on the websites of solar satellites like SOHO and YOKO. There's an updated image every day. Sky surveys in the extreme energy ranges don't turn up a lot of middle-aged stars. However, X-rays